Welcome to the Weekly Lead. I'm Pastor Becky Tirabasi, and every week I want to encourage you to be a leader in your sphere of influence. Will you join me for this week's message? It's been a while since I have done a podcast on William Wilberforce. He is definitely one of my heroes of the faith. If you are unfamiliar with him, he was a parliamentarian in the 18th century and a bit into the 19th century. But in 1797, he wrote a book I think everybody should read called Real Christianity. Of course, that's not the title from 1797. It was one of those very long titles, and I'm going to give it to you. It's called A Practical View of Christianity, and that was cut from A Practical View of the Prevailing Religious System of Professed Christians. Then it, you know, shortened a practical view, and then a practical view of Christianity, and now real Christianity. It is a tremendous book. I have led a Bible study and a series of eight traits of genuine faith on Wilberforce's book, Real Christianity. And I've done it with women. I've done it with Congress members. I've done it with young adults. It's a tremendous study, but it's just from the book. And it's studying the life of a man who exhibited eight traits of genuine faith. And I came up with them as I read his book over and over. They are, first of all, joy. Second, truth. Third, reputation. I suppose if I didn't ask you to grab a pen, you should do so. Four, maturity. Five, humility. Six, character. Seven, endurance. And eight, prayer. Even as I read the eight traits of genuine faith that I kind of uh, gathered from his book that were recurring themes, you could see that they're often in scripture. Romans 5, 3 through 5 is one of the scriptures that talks about character and endurance. And so as I studied Wilberforce's book, I would pick quotes from the book that were incredibly um, insightful about living the Christian faith as a leader. And believe me, this is truly about leadership. The traits that he picked, those eight traits or that I picked out from his book, were based on how he lived and what he believed. And one of the most succinct statements about what he believed was in a book by Pollock, P-O-L-L-O-C-K, if you'd like to read it, that detailed what Wilberforce believed. And he said this, heaven is real. He said the new birth is not an end, but a beginning. He believed that God's promises were sure and irrevocable and that a genuine Christian should be truly humble because of all Christ had done for him or her, meaning not in comparison to another person, but your life in comparison to what Christ has done for you. And then a true Christian or a real Christian would observe the Sabbath, pray, and fast for this purpose, to preserve his or her soul's health. I loved that. Wilberforce was adamant that joy was the prevailing feature of a Christian. And I had not read Pollock's book, which I just recently did when I wrote um, The Eight Traits of Genuine Faith as a study. It just came out of reading his own words that you knew he believed prayer was the prevailing feature of a Christian. Pollock also said this about Wilberforce. In matters of morality, humanity, or religion, Wilberforce was considered intuitive and certain. Neither rank nor power nor eloquence bewildered him for a moment. All the honors, all the wealth, and all the seductions that the world could furnish would not have tempted him to offend his conscience by even momentary hesitations. He closed, that is, Pollock closed with, 
Wilberforce had become, the conscience of England. So you see, um, Pollock's biography revealed that the chief source of Wilberforce's views was the Bible. The chief source of Wilberforce's view was the Bible. He said it was written to plain, unlettered men in a plain, popular way, not with logical precision or the accuracy of special pleading. The Bible had changed his life, and he found in it the authority and clarity by which he could test the opinions of writers and preachers. And that's very true. Wilberforce was um, a friend of many authors, a friend of many wealthy people, a friend of many parliamentarians, and a friend of many of the pastors and preachers of his day. He wrote to someone and said, my judgment rests altogether on the word of God, stressing to a lieutenant who had written him for spiritual counsel, he urged, if you read the scriptures with earnest prayer and a sincere desire for discovering the truth and obeying it, when known, I cannot doubt your attaining it. I just get all fired up when I read about Pollock. Another one of the books I'm having to read, the academic books for my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation is by William Haig. And in his title, he called Wilberforce the great slave, uh, the great man who abolished the slave trade. I mean, wow, what a uh, title to put in, to put that would honor your name. But Haig put it this way, while disdaining political ambition of the conventional kind, Wilberforce set out after his conversion, you see he was a parliamentarian prior to becoming a Christian. He was then a Christian in parliament and he almost left believing maybe I should go into ministry. But instead, he not only um, changed the entire moral climate of his country, but a good deal of the world. Uh, William Hague goes on to say, his opposition to the slave trade was a mere manifestation of an insistence on the value of Christian principles, which, when he gave voice to it, caused any hesitation or indecision to fall away. Wilberforce's great vision of moral and spiritual enrichment was what he lived for, whether in defending the institution of marriage, attacking the practices of the slave trade, or emphatically defending the Sabbath. His Christianity was of a unifying, effusive, and ecumenical kind. I want to close with a quote by Wilberforce, and I really would encourage you to get the book Real Christianity by William Wilberforce. If you're a leader in any capacity, if you have students, you won't believe it. The book starts out about the goal of parents. Is it to raise children who will make a lot of money or raise children who will live moral and godly lives? Yes, this is what he wrote in 1797, and I think it's in like the first four pages of his book. But I'll close with a quote about halfway through his book. He says, if you feel that your life does not reflect the reality of Christ in the way it should, do not lose heart. God is in the transformation business. Once your life has been invaded by the divine presence, he is able to change you from the inside out. The very fact that you struggle to be a person who reflects Christ's character is a sign that your faith is authentic. Don't give up. Don't become weary of attempting to be the man or woman God calls you to be. Keep a sharp eye on your behavior and never attempt to take the easy way out. Self-deception is one of the great enemies of a practical faith. I hope you're encouraged by William Wilberforce. I know he will. His writings will inspire you to live a life of changing culture, not only in your sphere of influence, but perhaps in our country and beyond to the world. Amen? Amen. 
hope you've been encouraged by this message. And I hope you join me weekly for the Weekly Lead Podcast. Meanwhile, follow me daily on Instagram. The link is in the bio with everything you need to become a weekly leader.